So during these meetings, we've been taking up different words, um, words that are, are found in our Bibles and words that uh, are very predominant in the gospel. And yet they're words that are extremes at times, words that are on the opposite end of a spectrum. And we've been seeking to show each night how the gospel message, the good news, that's what gospel means, the good news of Jesus Christ, how it takes these words and unites them. And how we've looked each night, we've looked at words like lost and found. We've looked at words such as one and all, words like light and darkness. And tonight, we're going to look at two words. My word tonight to speak on is the word division or divide or divisive. Um, this word that means to, to separate. And Matt, in the second part of the meeting, is going to speak on the word unite. To divide and to unite. Quite the opposite thing. And we're going to speak tonight from God's word and just bring out things uh, that are seen clearly in the Bible that will maybe show you how the gospel both divides and it unites. And so if you have a Bible, I'm going to read in a very famous chapter tonight. It's in the gospel of John, John chapter 10. We're going to read a few verses together, John 10 and verse 17, John 10 and verse 17. You open your New Testament, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John's one of those really loved books in the New Testament. That's where we get John 3 and 16 from. That's where we get one of the great cries from the cross from. It is finished. It comes from the Gospel of John. And so as we look through this book, there is a lot of much-loved stories and verses that come from this great Gospel writer. A lot of unique material here. And we're going to read a couple verses tonight in John 10. And these few verses, John 10 and verse 17 says this. John 10 and verse 17. Therefore, does my father love me? This is the Lord Jesus speaking. Therefore, does my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again? No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. Now notice the next words. After the Lord Jesus said that, notice what the people say or what it says about them. It says this, there was a division, therefore, amongst the Jews for these sayings. Because of these words, there was a major division amongst the people that heard these words. These are truly foundational words in the gospel. And when the Lord Jesus says about the ability to give his life and to take it back, to resurrect from the dead, not only that, but the father would love him because he would lay down his life. You can read these verses and read this great chapter, John 10. It's the chapter of the good shepherd giving his life for the sheep and so many other much loved scripture is found in this chapter. But I want to focus on these verses tonight and just bring this uh, into its context about being divided. When we talk about being divided, I'm reminded religion is a divisive topic. I, I, when I grew up, which isn't that long ago, you, you know, politics and religion were the things you didn't talk about. You try going out today, you can't talk about anything. You can't talk about masks. You can't talk about, um, you can't talk about dietary restrictions. You can't talk about education's divisive. Politics is divisive. Uh, where you go to school is divisive. Uh, there are so many things that, that we would say, oh, I could, I could talk about that in the past. Not anymore. It seems no matter what subject you bring up, it's going to divide. I was even reminded not long ago, I brought up the weather to someone and somehow it was very quick to turn to uh, the way that climate is changing and the disorders that are being. I thought even weather, weather, the most boring of all subjects that you could bring up with your neighbor is now divisive. So we look at subject matters in life and say they divide every every one of them. There's no safe even sports. Talk about sports now. I used to tune out during the election year to sports radio and you'd say you can't do it anymore. It's divisive. No matter where you go, there is division by these topics. But here, when we come to the gospel, I want you to take note the way it divides people. And yet the way that we will see tonight that it's by people's choice. That Christ has naturally divided. You even think when you wrote out the date today, when you wrote out, when you got your pen out and decided to write the day uh, and you wrote it down, July. I don't even know what day it was today. 
the 16th or 17th, and you wrote it out. You said just there, you were living proof to the fact that Christ divides because we get our calendar from the BC and the AD before Christ and after his death. So significant, but because Christ was one who had no beginning, born in Bethlehem, eternally the son of God, after his death. I love it. It's not after his death. It's annual Dominic. It's in the year of our Lord. He lives. He's alive. We celebrate a man when we write out the date who is alive, but he, he separates time. He separates eternity. The Lord Jesus says, if you die in your sins where I am, you cannot be. He has divided people's eternities. In fact, in Matthew 7, he talked about a narrow way that leads to heaven and a broad way that leads down to destruction. He talked about himself being a door, but divided. He divides the ages. He, he divides time. He divides eternity. He divides what is true. He said himself, I am the truth. It doesn't matter what you think is true. What matters is what Christ says is true. He is the embodiment of truth. The only human being who could say that. Sometimes we, we recognize he divides what is good and bad. Sometimes I think, well, that's not so bad or that's not so good. What's it my determination? Jesus Christ decides that. And so we'll recognize right away in this man, there is a lot of things that are divided. But so specific when we come down to what we're speaking on tonight, I want to look at these verses really quickly here and show you, you say, why did these verses divide people? Why were people upset? Those seem like very just innocent verses that the Lord Jesus could say, you know, these words that Jesus Christ spoke still divide people. When you read in this much loved book of John, there's only three times that the words of Lord Jesus caused division. One time. It was because of where he came from. You could read in your time, John chapter 7, and you'll read these words, and they were divided because they didn't know where Jesus Christ had come from. They said, we think it should have been Bethlehem, but it may have been Galilee, and they were divided. Where did he come from? And then if you go on reading, you can read in John chapter 9, and there he heals a blind man, and they were divided because of what he did. Not only where he was born, they were divided because of his actions. They said. This man, he's, he's not religious enough. They disdain the fact that he wasn't religious enough for them, but instead Jesus Christ wanted relationships instead of religion. And it made him mad, it divided him. And here in John chapter 10, we have the final time that his words divided people. And I wanna speak on them very shortly. What divided people was this? Jesus Christ talked about his death. And I want to think about the three ways that he talked about his death. He talked about his death as a reason that his father loved him. He talked about his death as being something that was voluntary. He chose to die. He says, I lay down my life. And finally, I want to think about his death as something that he conquered. He says, I take it back. I laid down my life. I took it back. No man can take it from me. And so the resurrection of Jesus Christ is something that divides people. Those three things I want to focus on in just the next couple of minutes. The fact that the Father loved him. We read those words, the words of Christ, and he says, the Father loves me because. Tremendous thing in life. When you hear someone tell you the reason they love you, sweeter sounds can't hit human ears than when you hear reasons, children, loved ones, family members, you name it. You give me a person who could say, I love you because, and those are words that, that sing in the human ear. But I say this to you, that as soon as you give someone a reason to love you, that same reason could also be a reason for that love to be taken away. Because if you give up that reason, if they love you because of something, what happens when you lose it? I can tell you tonight from the word of God that God doesn't love me for any reason. God doesn't love me because. He's never asked for a reason to love me, nor could I ever give him a reason to love me. That bothers a lot of people. That divides a lot of religions on earth because I think for the most part, people are looking to give God a reason to love him. If I, if I attended church more, if I read more, if I prayed more, if I gave more, if I did more, God would love me. And all the time in the 66 books of this Bible, Never once has man been able to give a reason to God for him to love them. And yet we still try. We still want to do something to make the divine love us. But yet over and over and over again, we just read of instances in which men have given God reason to not love them. 
and yet the father loves me. God loves the world. And there's not a reason given. And I think that is one of the most tremendous truths of the Bible. You want to know why? Because that's a love that I can never be outside of. There's nothing I can do to dis distance myself from the love of God because I never gave him a reason to love me to begin with. But this is true. And the book of Romans tells me this in chapter five, that God demonstrated his love in this way, that Christ died for us. That Christ died for the ungodly. And here, and only here in John 10, do we read of the only man to walk planet Earth that ever gave God a because to love him. Only one man. From Adam to the person born today, there's only been one man that gave God a because to love him. What was the reason? Because he was willing to lay down his life. Here was a perfect man. God manifest in flesh. And the father loved him because he was willing to lay down his life. It divides people because if you realize tonight there was nothing you could do to earn God's love, you would realize this. You have everything to gain in order to know that God loves you enough that he gave his son to die for your sins. You could believe that and you could stop depending on your resume and you could start depending on the relationship that you could have with Jesus Christ because God loves and God gave. And here, one of the most divisive things that this world has ever heard is that you can't earn his love, but that you can believe on the one that he loved because he gave his life. Next, we read of a voluntary death. And men hate this too, because people want to believe that there were, there were individuals, Romans who crucified him. They want to believe that there were Jews that tried him and found him guilty. They want to believe that there were individuals that day in which the guilt could be pinned to. Maybe there are, but the Bible says this, Jesus Christ gave his life voluntary. No man took it from him. The Romans that nailed him to the cross did not take his life from him. The Jews that gave him to the Romans did not take his life from him. It did not take men that day to take his life. Jesus Christ laid down his life. He did it voluntarily. Why? He did it for you. Those of us that one day will live no longer stand to gain an eternity with Christ because of the voluntary death of Jesus Christ. It divides people. Because people want to blame someone when all the while the blame falls directly and squarely on me. I'm the reason he was crucified. I'm the reason he was there. But thank God he was not forced. Thank God he did it voluntarily because he loved me. He gave himself for me. It divides people. They want to believe that he was there and that someone else is to be at blame. My friend, Jesus Christ gave his life and he chose to. Finally, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If this man is alive today, if he defeated death, and these years later he is alive and living, then, then there is nothing else. There is no other way to heaven than through this man. Because death is the one thing that stings every one of us. Doesn't matter where you are or who you are. This is the one thing that puts the fear and panic into everyone's heart. It's death. It's that it all ends one day. And here's the man who defeated the great terror of terrors. Jesus Christ, it divides humanity because if a man really came back from the dead and no longer dies, then this is unbelievable. This man truly must be the son of God. He must be God. And if that is so, what I give to God is meaningless because God gave everything when he gave himself. Christ gave everything and he died and was buried and he rose again. If he rose again, salvation is through no one else than this man. It's not through a church. It's not through a commandment. It's not through penance. It's not through pennies, prayers, priests, or pastors. It's through the precious blood of Christ. Nothing more. And my friend, nothing less. You could believe this. And you know what? You'd say, I would be divided from the man who loved me enough to give himself for me no longer. Because the greatest division that this life affords is to be divide, divided from my maker, to be divided from my savior. But these words, though they have divided people for ages, let them tonight be the words that unite you with your savior, with the one who loved you. As Matt continues to speak and to tell us about one who unites, realize this, 
There is much division that has come from Christ. But when we look at him on a cross, we realize this. It was all for the sake that the division that was created by me would be no longer and that I would be reconciled to God through the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Continue to listen as Matt tells us about the way in which Christ unites. Thanks, Dave. We're going to read two verses uh, in our Bible. Thanks to all that are on the call tonight. I know there's many things we could be doing on a Thursday evening. We're just thankful that you're with us. Uh, two verses, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 says this, as Jesus is speaking, he says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And the other verse I have, only two verses tonight, but uh, very same theme, uh, is in John chapter 6 and verse 37. And Jesus is speaking again, and he says, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. And so if you were with us this week, uh, on Sunday, we spoke about one and all. Those are the two words that we took up. One Savior died for all sin. One substitute, the person of Christ, died for one sinner. That's you. One Savior that's sinless died for all of humanity that is sinful. Brother Dave took up those words that the love of Christ compels believers because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose Again, there are men and women who have dedicated their lives to spread this message, the gospel. They're no longer living for themselves. They've been saved. They came to trust Christ. And now for the one that died for them, they're willing to give their life for him and spread the message of the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever realized on the call today that Christ died for you? That's the message of the gospel. Christ came. He lived. He died. He was buried. And he rose again. He came not to condemn the world, but that the world through him would be saved. So the gospel, the word of God is pointing individuals to the person of Christ. On Monday, we took up those words, darkness and light, darkness of the heart of humanity, darkness displayed on a cross, the light of the gospel, the light of the world, the light being Christ who came into the world. John 3 and 19 says, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Yet he also said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me, Jesus said, will not walk in darkness, but have the light of light. A soul on this call today, you represent a precious soul to the God of heaven. Have you ever in darkness, maybe you're not saved, maybe this message is foreign to you, but have you ever met the light? Have you ever met Christ? Have you ever come to understand the gospel, a very simple message of God loving sinners who are undeserving it of it? Have you ever come to accept who Christ is as the Godhead, as the Savior of the world, but also as your personal savior. On Tuesday, we spoke about uh, poor and being rich. Christ who is rich becomes poor for you and for me. The poor state of humanity, unable to buy or work our way to heaven, to have our sins forgiven, to pay for a, a, a spot in heaven, if I can use those words. Poor, poor human beings. Christ came, the rich one, to pay for us who are poor. Dave used those words, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Christ, yet for your sakes, he became poor that you through his poverty might become rich. Is there someone on the call as we reflect on Tuesday? You've come to realize that God's storehouse or the storehouse of heaven's love vault opened for you when God sent his son. Again, not to condemn a world, but that the world through him would be saved. You being that person, not joining a church, not joining an organization, just resting through faith that God gave us a gift of eternal life. And that was provided for when Jesus died on a cross, he was buried, and he rose again. Wednesday, yesterday, we spoke about being lost and being found. If you're not saved today on the call, the Bible tells us that you're lost. I was lost for 22 years of my life until God found me and saved me. Luke 19 and verse 15 says, For the Son of Man, Christ, is come to seek and to save that which was lost. We spoke about the lost sheep and the value of it. We spoke about the lost coin and the value of it. But really, ultimately, as that love crescendos to the lost son and how a father loved his son, there's joy in the presence of angels over one sinner that comes to repentance, over one sinner who has a change of mind of who God is and who they are and who Christ is. And the father says, as he reflects on taking the son, as he said, this my son was dead and is alive, was lost, the two words that we spoke about yesterday, and is found. Tonight, uh, we're going to speak on, Dave spoke on divisiveness, or I'm going to speak on inclusivity of the gospel. He used the word unity of the gospel. 
that could be used in the same capacity. Unity being uh, individuals that are broken in their relationship with God and now mended through the person of Christ. And so as we look at this here, we trust that God will give us help through the word of God. When we think of all inclusive, uh, if you look at resorts, I've, I've gone to some in the past, uh, but you think everything's included. And, and when it's an all inclusive resort, and some of you have perhaps traveled a lot more than I have, but there's always some hidden fee. And for example, you can't take the towels home. You can't take the blankets home. You can't, right? There's always something. Maybe there's a parking fee or a, or a hidden resort fee. But I, can I tell you this one? God speaks about the all-inclusive message of the gospel. Nothing is hidden. The complete package, sins forgiven, sins paid for, a relationship with God in Christ, heaven as your home. And Jesus says, come unto me. All you who are laboring and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. John 6 says, Jesus says, the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Another version has said, I will by no way throw out. I love that. ISV says this, I'll never turn away the one who comes to me. Weymouth New Testament says, him that comes to me, this is probably my favorite one, I will never on any account drive away. You come to Christ the way you are, just the way you are, in full transparency, in full vulnerability, and he will take you just the way you are. Come unto me, Jesus says. Jesus' authority here is being shown. Only God can call a soul to himself, not a preacher saying, come. I could never call you to myself, not to be saved, that's for sure. Not a pastor can call you to come. Not a priest can call you to come. God says, come. The invitation is absolutely unthinkable in the mouth of anyone else but God. Woe to the man who call people to themselves instead of calling people to the person of Christ. And he says these words, come, he draws none away. The destitute, come. The liar, come. The religious self-righteous one, come. The one who's in darkness, come. The young boy who's on the call today, come to Christ. The young girl who's on the call today, come to Christ. The older man, the older woman, the poor, come. The rich, come. The educated, come to Christ. The non-educated, come to Christ. The greedy one, come to Christ. The prideful one, come to Christ. The Jew and the Gentile, the Bible says, come. The sinner, Jesus is saying, come to me. Come to a cross. Come see what Christ did for you on a cross. He paid for sins in full on a cross. Never a sacrifice to ever emulate or ever identify with the person of Christ. He satisfied the Godhead for eternity, and he did that all for you. One might say on the call today, no sin. I don't commit sin. Robert Murray McShane, a great preacher, said these words. The seed of every sin is in my heart, he said. That's searching. Mankind is capable of any sin. And Jesus is saying, the covetous, come. The one who covets his neighbor, come to me. The selfish person who lives life all about themselves, you come to me. The one that has anger all the time, you come to me. The sinner, you come to me. Again, the person perhaps listening says, listen, Matt, no sin. I don't live in darkness. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 9, as I quote the word of God, says these words. Who can say, the writer says, I have kept my heart pure. Who can say I am clean and without sin? Mark chapter 7 and verses 21 through 23 or, say, or so say these words. For it within, out of a person's heart, evil thoughts come. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 says this. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Genesis 6 and 5 says this. That the Lord saw the wickedness of men was great in the earth. And that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. No sin. No darkness. No need of a savior. No need to come to him. Jesus is crying out. He's imploring. He's, he's asking. He's saying, listen, come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Him who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. I will never throw to the side the person that comes to me, broken in their sin, and cast all their faith and trust on me as the person that died for them on the cross of Calvary. Jesus saved in the, in the New Testament, the nobleman's son. Jesus cast out unclean spirits. You say, well, uh, Matt, are you sure it's all inclusive? Are you sure that God welcomes anyone to come to him? He cures Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. He heals the leper. He heals the centurion's servant. He raises the widow's son from the dead. You say, boy, quite a bit of things. Yeah, he cures the demon-possessed man in the Gadarenes. He cures a paralytic. He raises the ruler's daughter from the dead. He cures a woman with an issue of blood. She'd been bleeding for 12 years. 
He causes two blind men to see. A demon-possessed man who can't talk, Jesus heals and makes him speak. He heals an invalid man. In other words, a man who was very sick. He couldn't even bring himself to the pool of Bethsaida. Too sick to care for himself. Can I tell you, dear friend, on the call today, if you've never come to know Christ, if you don't have a relationship with the God of heaven, there's never been a time in your life when you just came to him just the way you are and you accepted that God was satisfied with his son's death for your sins on a cross. I will tell you today, you're like this man. I was like this man for 22 years of my life, too sick in my sins. I couldn't even care for myself in my sins. For the son of man has come. What did Dave speak about? To seek and to save that which was lost. And Jesus tells this man after 38 years of being sick, rise up and walk. And God today wants you to walk through the person of Christ. Notice that the Lord, as he says, come to me, the Lord never said to these people he saved then and who he saves today, do this or do that or don't do this and don't do that. Dave mentioned the de divisive things in the gospel today. There are some that think that I can come to him when I've done enough. That's divisive. There's certain religions that would teach that if you could just do enough, you could merit eternal life. You could take everything that you've offered, every that accomplished and wrap them up and collect all the good works of the world from every human being who's ever touched planet earth past and future and bring them to the heart of I would tell you look at my son the work of Christ some might think come when you're good enough that's not what the Lord said Christ said come to me did he say come to a church he never said that did he say come to a rabbi he never said that did he say come to confess your sins to a priest he never said that did he say come to a statue perhaps of mary or statue of a state or some religious statue he never said that he said you come to me when you come to me did he say did he say to dress professional no when you come to me is it make sure that you address me in a certain manner some vernacular some certain language christ said no you come to me that's all he said when you come to me, make sure you're not wearing too much of the world's thing. Sort of try to impress. No, Christ said, you come to me just the way you are. What he did say is come unto me, all that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. We come to the cross, and there's rest found at the cross for all the burdens and the regret and our sin. All that weight is placed upon the person of Christ. And him that comes to him, the sinner that comes to Christ, he says, I will in no, my, no means cast out. What he didn't say was go to Moses or go to a prophet. No, Jesus said, come to me. Inclusive. He brings people in from all parts of the world. He wants to save sinners. We come to have a personal trust in him. Charles Spurgeon said to Jesus himself, we must come by a personal trust, not to doctrine, ordinance, nor ministry are we to come first, but we come first to the personal savior and we come to a cross. That word later implies burdens that we take on ourselves. Come unto me, all you that later and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Burdens we take on ourselves through perhaps our own natural sinful selves. Heavy laden. He says, come unto me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. These might, perhaps might be burdens others put upon you. Jesus had spoken, Matthew 23, religious leaders of that day who binded heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they laid them on men's shoulders. Perhaps the burden you're facing today, as I faced for 22 years of my life, the weight of our sins is a burden. The regret of our sins is a burden. Maybe it's a burden you've been to others because of sin. Maybe it's a burden others have been to you because of their sins. Life stresses, trials, opportunities, challenges. And Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. I like what Oswald Chambers said. as He said, one has said that it's humiliating to be told that we must come to, to Christ. You say, well, well, why? Well, think of the reasons you wouldn't come to Christ. It tests our authenticity. Why wouldn't I come to Christ? Well, I can't come to him with this particular sin, or I can't come to him with this specific sin. There's no way I'm giving up that sin. Or maybe you don't want to come to him because there's got to be more in your mind. There has to be more to salvation than just simply coming to him. We'd rather argue. We'd rather evade the issue of coming to him altogether. But maybe we'd rather just go through a heartache and try to fix our own sin on our own and then come. Christ says, don't try fixing your sin on your own. You come Unto me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know what he said? Oswald Chambers, let me quote. As long as we have even the least bit of spiritual disrespect, it will always reveal itself in the fact that we are expected to tell us to do very big. Call today. All he wants us to do is to come. He says, come to me. Rest. Oswald how often have you come to God with your and walk away with nothing in quotes? 
Yet the whole time God has stood with his hands out, not to take you, but all to take him. Just think of the uncomfortable and untiring patience of Christ, who to this day is still lovingly calling you today on the call today, calling, come unto me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you inclusivity of the gospel. John chapter 3 and verse 16, listen to what Christ says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Inclusivity of the gospel, someone might ask. John 3 and verse 36, he who believes in the son has everlasting life. Inclusivity of the gospel, someone might ask. Romans 5 and verse 8, God demonstrates his love toward us, humanity inclusive and that while we're yet sinners christ died for us inclusivity of the gospel romans 8 32 he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all inclusivity of the gospel listen to these words this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that christ jesus came into the world to save sinners and paul says of whom i am chief inclusivity of the gospel first john 4 and 10 says here is love not that we loved God. I think Dave used this verse earlier, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Inclusivity of the gospel post-salvation. You know, Galatians tells us there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. I'm going to end with a quick hymn. Charlotte Elliott wrote this. She lived 17 to 1821. And... Uh, was going through a dark period of her feelings of uselessness, loneliness. She remembers a sermon that someone had preached on come to Christ just as you are. And this hymn is titled Just As I Am. But in the 1849 edition uh, of a hymnal called Hours of Sorrow, Cheered and Comforted, this hymn, Just As I Am, was called Him That Cometh to Me, I Will In No Wise Cast Out, John 6 and verse 37. Now listen to what she's saying. You wonder, well, how can I come to Christ? She writes these words, just as I am, though tossed about. With many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings within, and fears without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, poor, wretched, blind, sight, riches, healing of the mind. Yes, all I need in thee to find, in Christ, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relief. Because thy promise, I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Jonathan Edwards said these words, how can you expect to dwell with God forever if we so ne neglect and forsake him here. What does Jesus say in the word of God? Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The one who comes to me, he says, I will by no means cast out the inclusivity of the gospel. God is calling the sinner tonight to come to him just the way you are, to have faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for you who paid for your sins, who would love to call you his, who would love to take you out of darkness and bring you into light, take you out of the family of sin and bring you into the family of God and call you his. And you would know for sure from the word of God that you have a home in heaven because Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Let's pray. And then we're going to make some announcements here.